So we're here to talk about stress and the impact of it and trying to really get our understanding of how stress uh, impacts health in our bodies. And it's really one of my favorite topics to talk about because everybody is um, is exposed to stress in some way and we're not we're we're not immune to it. So let's get right into it. Um, first of all, I really like to do uh, my webinars with creating a foundational understanding of of what we're talking about. So in this case, it's stress and really getting down to some basics because often we can forget about how things work in our body and when we have an understanding how that works, we can apply things to actually change those processes. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about how it impacts very practical things like hormones and immunity uh, and gastrointestinal health. And then finally, we're going to give you some really um, straightforward lifestyle, nutritional, and supplemental strategies to actually tackle stress and to impact uh, and reduce its impact in the body. Uh, and then we'll talk, we'll end off with a few uh, really specific AOR formulations that are really great at addressing this specific thing. Uh, before I get into the, the, the bulk of the webinar, I just want to talk a little bit about myself, um, just so everyone understands where I come from. Um, I graduated from McMaster University, then studied naturopathic medicine in Toronto at CCNM. And then I went on to become a, a medical advisor with AOR, and I have a private clinical practice in Toronto. And my passion really is to bring high-quality education to people, whether it's healthcare pro uh, professionals, whether it's the public, whether it's the patients that I'm seeing. Uh, and ultimately, our health is uh, is the, the knowledge for our for us to actually be able to change it. So I think um, things like this webinar and, and other information is is very key for us turning our health around. Okay, so when we're talking about stress, we often we all know what stress is, but we haven't really kind of paused to think about what actually it, it does to us and what it is in our bodies. We all feel stress. We all know that, you know, that sweaty palm feeling and, and what our body does when um, our heart starts racing and our breath gets a little more shallow. Um, we need to have a better understanding of what that actually is. We all can experience it, but we all kind of experience it in different ways. And so the, actually the term stress um, was developed by, uh, by Dr. Hans Selye, and he was actually he's a Canadian. He's from McGill University, and he was studying... Um, he was a, a doctor in hospital in, uh, in Montreal, and he was looking at patients, and he actually noticed that all the patients that were sick in the hospital actually looked sick, and they had this look, and he termed that a stress, and his definition was the consequence of a failure of an organism to respond appropriately to emotional or physical threat, whether it's actually um, actual or imagined. And so the key thing here is that whether it's either real, whether the person's actually experienced it, or they think they're experiencing it. So that gives us a little key uh, information piece for what what might be a key process in stress. And Dr. Selye made one in his early definition was definitely a pioneer when it came to stress, but he made one specific oversight, and that actually stress is, stress is not a non-specific event, it's a very specific. So what that means is that we all experience it differently. And it really comes down to our perception of that event and our ability or our perceived ability to cope with it. So for example, giving a presentation may be stressful for somebody, uh, for one person, and for another person, it comes really easily. So that means that that stress is specific. And for that person that's able to cope with it, they don't have this cascade of, of signals that occur in the body that basically is the stress cascade when the person that is, obviously that is going on within them. And for something to be stressful, um, there, is, there is a prescription or there's a recipe for stress. So there's four key parameters for something to be uh, stressful for a person. Um, so first one is novelty. So it has to be, has to be new. Um, it, it can't be something that they've experienced before or usually isn't. Um, unpredictability is, is a key parameter for stress. Um, often people won't feel like they're in control, and that's the last point. They lose their sense of control. Uh, and finally, threat to ego. And probably the most overlooked aspect of stress or parameter for something to be stressful because just as that definition from Dr. Selling was, is that stress actually can be an emotional thing, and we all know that. We all experience that. 
But we often don't realize that something that we engage in from a mental and emotional perspective can be just as stressful as a physical event. And of course, that is all tempered by individual differences. Everybody has different aspects of these things that are more, they're more susceptible to or they have better coping skills with. Um, also, it's important to understand that there are certain things like a natural disaster that everybody feels stressed. And then there's something like uh, public speaking um, or maybe doing a presentation at work, um, meeting a new person. Those are open to interpretation. Those are relatively stressful events. But the key point on this slide is that stress can either be positive or negative. A lot of times this is overlooked because when we break it down, if we have the ability to cope with that and recover from that, then actually stress is a good thing because the whole point of it is to improve physiological function. Our body is very good at that. A perfect example is when we go to the gym to work out or get on a treadmill. That actually is stress. We are all stressing our cardiovascular and our muscular systems. Now, that's a, an example of positive stress where the body will actually, or we're hoping the body recovers to a greater degree than it was before, otherwise we wouldn't work out. But this stress is that that, that particular event or that particular action is beyond our coping ability. And then now it causes negative effects in the body. So let's get into the physiology. Let's kind of pop the hood and really look at what's going on. Because like I mentioned right off the top is that when we understand the physiology of how stress works, we have a much better uh, appreciation for uh, how we can impact it. So this is kind of this very simplified stress pathway. But it really um, shows the point that we want to, that I want to highlight. So it doesn't matter what type of stress it is, whether it's a tornado bearing down or it's a tornado of schoolwork or 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 something at the workplace or in a family that's going on. The brain perceives this as being stressful, and then it creates a pathway or, or secretes certain hormones through, that go through the uh, pituitary gland and then finally to the adrenal gland and secrete a hormone card called cortisol. We're going to be referring to cortisol quite a bit because that's the key stress hormone when it comes to um, impacting the body, positive and negative. We're going to we're going to talk about that. And also, you can see up here in the brain, uh, norepinephrine is also secreted. So this helps the body be ready for action. So you can see we've all experienced this over here. The stress response is that we all feel like we're ready for action. Our, resp our respiration increases. Blood flow is redirected to the, to the areas of the body, such as the brain, heart muscles, that really need uh, muscle action and blood flow for, for movement for action to occur. So that's the, that's the stress cascade. Now, it's important to understand because we're going to be referring back to the adrenal glands a number of times. Often, very, very often overlooked glands, but we uh, in, the, in the naturopathic and alternative health field know how important the adrenal glands are because they are responsible for the secretion of this very important hormone called cortisol. And also it secretes a number of other, they secrete another number of other hormones but more, most importantly, we're going to talk about cortisol today. So cortisol has a number of actions in the body. And so we, we can see I just kind of picked the, the top few actions that are most applicable to what we're talking about. But if you can look through each one, so we'll just kind of just touch on each one. So, for example, aids in breakdown of carbohydrates and fats, uh, increases blood sugar, um, increases blood pressure, uh, has an anti-inflammatory effect, shuts down the reproductive system and reduces bone formation. If you look at the theme of all the actions of cortisol, they're actually all preparing the body for a state of action. It's, it has a stimulating effect. So it increases blood sugar. That actually, um, the, the body wants to do that because now the muscles and the brain and the heart has fuel for action to occur. So keep this in mind as we go forward because, as you can see, it also says um, cortisol's action is to shut down the reproductive system and to reduce bone formation. Now, this makes sense if we look at the action of cortisol as being just trying to maintain the immediate, get us out of, you know, a, a jam or, or stressful situation because it wants to turn off all the non-essential things in the body. And 
when we're thinking about survival, which is what the signal, the cortisol is actually telling our bodies, is that we don't really want to be focusing on reproduction and bone formation. Those are non-essential for, for life, to sustain life. So um, just to kind of keep that in mind, this is the, the environment of the action of, this, of cortisol. So we know we just identified that cortisol is beneficial, has a wide range of actions. And the problem that occurs with cortisol is that when you start shifting that stress response from an acute phase, so cortisol being elevated or being activated through the adrenal glands acutely, and then chronically, now it's being elevated for a longer period of time without its ability to come back down to normal. And now we have chronic dysregulation, so either too high or actually even too low. And we're going to look at this. And ultimately, um, the body's trying to adapt to something. Uh, and cortisol is the hormone that tries to do that. But in that process, things start getting dysregulated and, uh, and come out of balance. So the key thing to adapting to stress is this concept of allostasis. So unlike homeostasis, which is its close, uh, close uh, linguistic relative, homeostasis is actually regulating within one very tight set point. So for example, body temperature is a great example of homeostasis. It can't go below a certain number, otherwise systems, cells, and processes start to shut down. Conversely, allostasis actually is that if the body now is being put into a new uh, stress or a new demand is being placed on it, the body will actually change to accommodate that. So it's adjusting to a new steady state. So this is important because when we're under stress, this is what our body's trying to do. This is what it's trying to do. It's, it's trying to adapt to that increased demand. And so it either will adapt to it, or as you can see in the, in the pictures, you will, the body will fail on not being able to stand up to the demands that it's being placed under. So that's how important allostasis is. This graph actually is um, what Dr. Sellier came up with when he was looking at the first concept of stress. And it's a graph called the general adaptive syndrome. And basically what that is is that if we look at the yellow section right here, this is our body being under stress. And our body's trying to adapt to that stress. So it secretes hormones. We, talk, we talked about cortisol, norepinephrine. And it goes up. And ideally, you can see this purple line here. Ideally, uh, that's where it'll actually go and it'll be um, it'll come back down to normal. So there's a normal up and down, and that's a healthy response to stress. But unfortunately, many times, we actually, uh, our stress levels do not, we do not recover from them, and our cortisol levels continue to rise. And finally, that's where we're trying to adapt to it, and finally, we can move into an exhaustive phase. So there's three phases, alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And so we're going to talk about these a little bit more in depth, in depth and how they pertain to how we deal with stress and what each one of those phases look like, looks like. So the first phase is called the alarm phase. And so this is obviously essential for us for survival. So a perfect example of this is um, a sporting event. So if you're getting ready for, for a game or a competition, then the, the, our body is actually being prepared for action. So our hormones are being secreted because we need fuel and we need muscles and heart and our brain to be very active, to be very focused. Once that stress is removed, once the sporting event is over, uh, once we get out of, let's say, a car accident or a stressful event, our body will re recover back to normal function. But what if this stress, as the, is the case with many of our our situations in our daily lives, what if this becomes chronic? And then we move into the second stage, which is now called the resistance phase. So our body's trying to adapt. We're trying to hold that weight up, and our cortisol is high, typically in the, in the resistance phase. So our body manages for a while, um, and then we go through a period of trying to adapt to, um, to the stress. So you can see here on the on the left side, this is the body having an adequate response. So if you can see the increase in function because of the demand, the stress, 
occurs. You can see this graph here, and then we return back down to normal. And then repeatedly, um, we go through that stressful process. Now, unfortunately, during that resistance phase and during the process of our body trying to adapt, we can actually get to the point where we can our body no longer is able to keep up that high level of function anymore, and that function starts dropping off. And that's when we start getting certain symptoms associated with stress and associated with that chronic load the body's trying to deal with. And then finally, this is where you go into that third stage, the exhaustive stage. I think all of us have kind of heard of the idea of adrenal fatigue before. Uh, and it's a it's a... It's a term that is not readily embraced by every single healthcare pro uh, professional out there, but it's definitely one that is seen a lot, and a lot of people experience it definitely from a naturopathic perspective. And this is uh, another way of calling this exhaustive phase, where the body's ability to secrete cortisol has been so far depleted that it can only secrete very small amounts, or if it does, it secretes them in dysregulated levels. You can even see there's this, uh, there's a number of studies showing that chronic, this, chronic fatigue syndrome, and actually to some degree fibromyalgia as well, actually has a uh, chronic underfunctioning of the hypothalamus pituitary axis, which is what HPA stands for. So that's almost like a spectrum from fatigue, adrenal fatigue, exhaustion, and finally chronic fatigue, maybe the, the last or the, the furthest gone stage. And each one of these stages, but especially the resistance and exhaustive phase, they lead to dysfunction in many other bodily systems. And we're going to touch on a few of these uh, in, in upcoming slides. From a very uh, practical and, and clinical perspective, there's a number of ways to assess what phase you may be in in terms of the stress response. Um, typically, though, also there's clinically, you can see, there's some typical symptoms that are associated with the resistance phase or the high cortisol phase. So blood pressure will either be normal or on the higher end. People will have a tougher time losing weight, and it will be stored around the trunk. Um, they're predisposed to osteoporosis. Um, as we talked about, high cortisol actually downregulates osteoblasts and uh, the formation of bone. Um, blood sugar is definitely dysregulated. Um, there's all sorts of cravings going on, which is actually the same for the exhaustive phase, and you can see that's low blood sugar, so we have um, additional cravings. And you can see so on and so forth. Um, these are just, just an example of certain clinical things that we, uh, we may see with a patient uh, as, as a naturopathic physician, but you may be experiencing yourself uh, or in family members. A classic symptom of the exhaustive phase is, is low blood pressure, especially when you get a, a dizzy head on rising. Um, and also there will be things like, um, as mentioned, uh, low blood sugar, and there will be actually difficulty putting on muscle. So it will be actually the opposite of actually having that adiposity around the waist. So we'll touch on a few of these in a little bit more depth because there's some really key points to pull out of that. So we know that Cortisol is useful in the short run, but in the long run, uh, a glu glucocorticoids or catecholamines, that's basically the fancy words for cortisol and epinephrine, they have both protective and damaging effects on the body. They're essential in the short run, uh, but chronically elevated cortisol or chronically depleted cortisol, which is low, can be linked to a number of uh, symptoms, health conditions, and ultimately even diseases. So this is uh, the same um, same slide talking about the different effects of cortisol. And now I just kind of added a few things that put things more into focus and more into perspective. Um, just connecting cortisol and connecting stress ultimately to some very common health con uh, issues that we experience in our society. Uh, diabetes, obesity, all comes back to the ability or the inability to properly metabolize blood sugar, osteoporosis, uh, and cortisol's ability to reduce bone formation, um, cardiovascular disease with blood pressure, and so on and so forth. Actually, now that some of the latest research is showing that chronic stress and cortisol especially can actually change and affect the memory and actually downregulates 
um, memory storage in an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is uh, very important for storing of memories. So there's a number of health conditions that I mentioned that have been linked to chronic stress. And so this is not an exhaustive list. Um, we're going to touch on a few of them, but um, we'll touch on things like sleep issues. We're going to talk. We, I talked about memory loss already. We're going to talk about obesity. But stress, basically the bottom line is that stress and its impact, the cascade, it starts in the body, has many different and very wide-reaching effects. So I think it's often a, an overlooked key risk factor um, or a, a key contributing factor to a lot of symptoms, a lot of diseases many people may be experiencing. So the impact of stress. Let's talk about this in, from a practical perspective and, and really kind of zoom in on some of the things that I've been talking about on, on actually making the connections between stress and uh, certain conditions. So the first one I'm going to talk about is stress and obesity. A lot of times people are, are wondering, you know, maybe it's, it's something I've tried to lose weight and I, and I can't do it. I've tried um, low-calorie diets. I've tried low-fat diets. Nothing's really working. Well, actually, stress is a key, key factor in the ability to lose weight. Because if you think about it, let's break it down for a second. Cortisol increases the fuel. We talked about the actions of cortisol. So it wants to create a fuel for the body, for the heart and for the brain and for the muscles, as I mentioned. And so what if now, instead of running away from a, you know, a, a life-threatening event like a, like a bear or our, our ancestors being attacked by a neighboring tribe or we're struggling for food for that, for that week or that month, we are now experiencing stress, but we don't have to actually expend any of that energy um, we are just under a constant state of stress, and we also combine that with inactivity. Chronic stress will actually increase blood sugar, and blood sugar will increase cravings, with, which further increase um, uh, calorie intake. And ultimately, that excess calorie and that chronic blood sugar being um, all over the place throughout the day, it's ultimately stored around the waist and, and stored as fat. One of the biggest stumbling blocks to people losing weight is actually stress and, and hormonal health. And this is the hormonal connection right here. Connecting stress and female hormones, another very important uh, topic because a lot of females are, are struggling with the impact that stress has on their lives, and they know that, and also the impact that things like menopause and PMS have on their, um, have on their lives. So when we think about it, there's, there's a really good graph in the next slide that's going to kind of highlight some of the things that I'm talking about on this slide. But our hormones are really produced from one specific precursor. It's actually all from cortisol. And progesterone is probably second or third on that list. And cortisol is actually produced from progesterone. So when we are producing high amounts of cortisol, we are stealing raw material away from production from those other materials because often overlooked is that adrenal function is very important, especially after menopause, after the ovaries stop producing estrogen, uh, then the adrenal glands kick in as being the main contributor of hormones for, for especially a woman. And now if the adrenal glands have been stressed and fatigued from already before, now that's really amplified as, uh, as a woman goes into menopause. So here's that graph showing that how cholesterol and then finally progesterone is the precursor to cortisol. So this dark black um, thicker arrow shows if the body is wanting more cortisol because it's trying to adapt to certain stress, now, all these other key hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, are no longer being able to be produced at the levels that are needed. So that's how actually cholesterol, or sorry, uh, cortisol can steal uh, building blocks from other hormones being produced. There's a big connection between stress and thyroid function. Definitely clinically, we see, um, as a naturopathic doctor, you see that Thyroid and adrenal gland function are, are very closely tied. Um, oftentimes, when somebody has a thyroid issue, they're definitely going to have an underlying adrenal issue. Um, 
also just from a from a physiological perspective, the way things work in the body, cortisol increases function in the body. <laughs> so the body's smart. So it's actually going to turn down the thermostat, which is the thyroid in the body, and it's it's actually cortisol acts to inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3. T4 is the inactive form of thyroid hormone, and T3 is the active form. So we have less active hormone in the thyroid, or be sorry, being produced by the thyroid, and then being converted in the body, because cortisol is actually going to be impairing that. So that's actually a kind of a fail-safe mechanism the body's produced, uh, the body has. And also epinephrine, norepinephrine, their precursor for their function is tyrosine, the same precursor that thyroid hormone is being used. So if we, again, the same idea as the slide before this, talking about how uh, if you take the precursor for one thing, in this case to make epinephrine, because that's what's being produced all the time, people feel anxious, people feel stressed, um, it may be taking away from the body's stores to produce thyroid hormone as well. So these are, these are two simple ways how stress and adrenal function and thyroid function is all connected. So let's now move into looking at some strategies to tackling stress from, a, from an integrative and natural perspective. Before we get into some supplemental strategies, let's talk about lifestyle first. Just thinking about it from a very simple perspective. Stress, as we talked about it, there's, there's a positive stress and there's a negative stress. We're talking about stress in the negative sense here. So stress typically is a negative input in our body. What we need to do from a, from a very simple perspective is to put more positive input and to decrease the negative input. So we need to shift the balance. So whatever the positive input is in your life, and this is individualized depending on each person. For some people, it's, it's being physically active. For other people, it's spending time with family. Anytime there is healthy positive input, that is going to be counterbalancing that negative input of stress. Oftentimes, we get overwhelmed. Our, our coping mechanisms get overwhelmed when we have too much negative input. Things like yoga, laughing, meditation, dancing, all these have actually been studied to reduce cortisol. And they really are positive inputs, positive lifestyle input that actually has now been connected to actually reducing the stress hormone cortisol. Yoga and meditation has improved immune function, increased breast cancer survival rates, which is uh, actually very, very exciting. Uh, and things like laughing, we know that laughter is the best medicine. Our grandparents have all told us that. It actually reduces the activation of things like epinephrine and the production of those things. So it turns down the, the stress that a brain or person may be experiencing. And on the flip side, studies show that anger compared to laughing actually increased the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so I think it's important for us to not overlook the impact, the very powerful impact of, of lifestyle and positive um, lifestyle input. From a herbal perspective, we need to touch on a class of herbs that are called adaptogens. These, uh, this class of herbs has a long history of use through traditional cultures and now into modern naturopathic and even some um, conventional medicine, uh, medical use. They really, uh, adaptogens really have a few key characteristics. Um, number one is that they increase the resistance of the person taking them to many different types of stresses, whether it's physical, whether it's biological, or chemical, and this is how they've been actually studied. And number two is that it acts as a general stabilizer or normalizer. So if cortisol is high, it helps bring it down. If cortisol is low, it helps bring it up. And it helps doing, do this by actually stimulating the, the processes that produce cortisol in the adrenal glands, um, or it actually helps impact some of these receptors that have a, a stabilizing effect rather than just giving something like cortisone, which is good to increase low cortisol, but then at a certain point, it'll be too much. So adaptions are great balancers. And the classic example, probably the most well-known, is ginseng. Uh, and it, it, is, it has an effect on immunity, uh, it has an effect on hormonal health, and on, on the ability for a body to deal with stress. 
So let's talk about a few of these. Withania or ashwagandha, um, also known as Indian ginseng, many, uh, many studies and a lot of long history of, uh, of, of use clinically in the Ayurvedic line of medicine or the Indian line of medicine. Um, really, it's been used as a tonic for many different things, um, but specifically when it comes to stress, there's been a number of studies that have shown it has the ability to help the body or counteract the body and the certain changes that occur within that, within your body, when it comes to blood sugar, when it comes to adrenal health and to cortisol levels. Um, what's really nice about withania is that it actually will reduce cortisol, so it's great for the resistance phase. Um, it also has a calming effect. So it actually will reduce the kind of activation of the nervous system. So that, that typical wired and tired uh, picture that a person that has high cortisol experiences. Because when we look at the symptoms of stress, um, it often just isn't just fatigue. There are things like uh, insomnia associated with it. There's things like anxiety. There's nervousness. Etc. We touched some of them on the on, in that chart that I that I showed previously, um, but withania is really nice because it has a nice calming effect. The other added benefits is that withania actually will improve immune function. It has been studied to increase thyroid hormone secretion, improves memory, and most recently it's been studied to actually increase nitric oxide, which as we get older decreases. And nitric oxide is very important for the function of our blood vessels and for getting nutrients and getting vitamins and oxygen to the areas of the body that need that need that need those ingredients and need those nutrients. So it has a wide ranging effects and really fits that adaptogen type of picture very, very well. Um, also a good point that I'd fail to mention about about withania is that it it all you need to take is with AORs. Gonda is that it's one cap a day, six hundred milligrams excellent safety profile on it, um, and it's been studied in a wide range of populations. Rhodiola rosa, another one that is from the, the Asian pharmacopoeia or the Asian traditional use. And a lot of these studies from on rhodiola has actually been from the Siberian or, or Russian, um, Russian scientists. And they've studied it for enhancing the body's ability to do physical and mental work. And this is the nice added benefit with rhodiola. Even though ashwagandha, it does have actually some nice uh, benefits when it comes to brain health, but specifically on maintaining a calm, focused energy, uh, rhodiola is excellent. It has balancing effects on anxiety, blood pressure, um, depression, and blood sugar, and improves concentration related to fatigue. So it really helps a person kind of get through a stressful period, and it reduces the negative effects that are occurring in the body because of that stress. AOR has two products. One recently we just got back, which is it's a rhodiola standalone. So it has a really nice 340 milligram dose when the rhodiola rosa with ginseng has, it really is a great combination for um, if somebody has a decreased amount of, um, of focus, you also have decreased immune function and fatigue is a big issue. Um, a lot of times um, ginseng is really good for helping to lift people up and people that are very, very fatigued. It's a, it's a very stimulating herb, and rhodiola rosa is a nice co a combination with that. Um, rhodiola has also been studied for things like um, mood issues. It's been studied with things like ADHD and anxiety at higher doses. And so the standalone rhodiola helps you get to those levels um, without actually having the, the panics for that. So it gives you two nice options. Oluthococcus, this is Siberian ginseng. So there's a number of ginsengs throughout the world. Um, most classically known, we know Panix ginseng, which is what's in the Rhodiola rosa. Uh, and that's classically, you know, the Asian ginseng. There's also American ginseng. Um, and Siberian ginseng, um, like Rhodiola, studied often by Russian scientists, and the, most, the bulk of the evidence is from that part of the world. But a really nice herb, not quite as stimulating as, as panic as ginseng, but it really helps people deal with stressful conditions, physical and mental stress, reduces heart rate, reduces blood pressure when a person is going through stress. Um, also, we should talk about uh, licorice because it is a very commonly used adaptogen. 
And what this adaptogen, this herb also has many different benefits. It has antimicrobial effects. It has um, the ability to traditionally been used for things like sore throats and, and chest infections. But when it comes to adrenal health, when it comes to, to cortisol, it actually has the unique ability to actually act like cortisol. So it's excellent for the exhaustive phase. Um, there have been some case reports that have showed that because it can stimulate the adrenal gland, adrenal glands don't just produce cortisol. They actually produce aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid. That's what you see here. So people that have high blood pressure have to be cautious with, with licorice. But for people that are in that exhaustive phase with the classic low blood pressure, um, it's an excellent herb um, to add in as your adaptogen. Um, also very important when it comes to adrenal health, we talked about adaptogens, but key vitamins B6, B5, and vitamin C are very important for the functional of the adrenal gland. When the body goes gets under stress, it actually will secrete the adrenal gland will actually secrete a lot of vitamin C. It's called vitamin C dumping. And that's for a number of reasons. When the body is under stress, we need more antioxidants to deal with those free radicals. But so, actually, it can, unfortunately, vitamin C can be depleted if it's now being put under stress for a long time. And then so, it's not being able to be used to do its action as an antioxidant uh, and formation of collagen, etc. So, it can actually be depleted B6, B5, and vitamin C can become depleted if there's hyperactivity of the adrenal gland and increased cortisol production. And in the resistance and exhaustive phases, the adrenal gland is actually using oh, these vitamins, um, B6, B5, and vitamin C specifically at much higher rates. So a lot of times people that are stressed will have deficient amounts of these, of these vitamins. Here's a really nice summary of all the different actions of certain B vitamins and how they relate to stress. So we talked about um, we talked about B6, we talked about B5. B6 is actually right here, uh, and B5 is right above it. That's um, pantothenine. And so B5 especially is very important for um, the adrenal function and the adrenal production of cortisol. Um, but also B12 is important for um, resetting circadian rhythms. We typically think of B12 as um, something that's low in anemia, but it's actually very beneficial for a number of things. And one of them is actually low B12 levels can actually disrupt sleep. Uh, we know that um, folic acid is important for a lot of things like neural tube formation, so we make sure that mothers get enough. But it's also very beneficial for any sort of methylation. What that means is that um, it's the turning on and the production of neurotransmitters and molecules in the brain that actually cause activity. So it's very important that we have a full spectrum of B vitamins. So uh, a very popular product is Advanced B Complex, where it actually is going to be giving you all the active forms of each one of these B vitamins, because this 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, that's the active form of folic acid which has a much better and stronger activity when it comes to, to brain function. Also, methylcobalamin, it's the, it's the form that's used best um, by the brain. Uh, P5P, which is the vitamin B6, is the active form B6. So it's very important to get the best and highest quality uh, forms of B, of B vitamins when it comes to re uh, repleting for any sort of health condition, but especially for adrenal health, uh, because we want... The, the most absorbable and most bioactive forms. So OrthoAdapt is probably AOR's premier adaptogenic formula in, in our stress formula. And the reason is, is that when you look at the ingredient list, it really create it, it has a very comprehensive approach. The things I didn't talk about, so we talked about all these things, ashwagandha, rhodiola, Siberian ginseng, licorice, uh, B5, pantheonine, and vitamin C, we didn't talk about adrenal tissue and adrenal cortex. Adrenal tissue and adrenal cortex basically is like supplying the building blocks 
um, for adrenal gland function. So actually, there's a there's a pharmaceutical medication called Armour Thyroid that actually is just that. It's actually desiccated thyroid from from cows from bovine source. And so this is a the same approach except for the adrenal gland, and. We have an orthodont vegan, which doesn't have the adrenal glandulars. It has a little more gentle effect, but definitely the effect that we see with, with, with people with orthodont is that it'll have a much uh, more profound and more immediate effect because the, that adrenal gland is actually supplying some of those key building blocks for the adrenal glands to work. So orthodont, a very comprehensive formula, um, and it's uh, a four-capsule-a-day dosing. Now, I skipped over diet just to come back to it right now because diet is very important when it comes to adrenal health and it comes to managing stress because as you can see a reoccurring theme throughout all the things we talked about, even the adaptogens, they do help the body deal with stress, but they also help the body deal with blood sugar uh, spikes. And one of the key things from a dietary perspective is that you want to limit that. Having a lot of blood sugar spikes throughout the day actually will put more metabolic stress on your body. So we'll have to secrete insulin more. Uh, and it and cortisol is further going to help, or it's actually not going to help, it's going to in, hinder blood sugar regulation. So we want meals that have adequate amount of protein, fat, and complex carbohydrate diets. And we want a steady nutrient supply throughout the day. So smaller meals throughout the day, good quality high nutrients, lower calorie meals actually are the best approach. Um, and one of the most important strategies is actually to uh, eat a complete breakfast because in the morning our body is ready for to take in all these nutrients. And after it's been fasting, as the word actually says, break fast, fasting throughout the night, <laughs> we need some good quality protein and often the thing that's most often um, left out of breakfast because we just grab something quick like a coffee and, and a muffin or a bagel and we really miss out on protein. So we set ourselves up for having unstable blood sugar for the rest of the day and lots of cravings. So diet is, is key and minimizing um, refined sugars. When it comes to balancing blood sugar, um, adaptogens, like I mentioned, they all have this added benefit of balancing blood sugar. So ashwagandha, all the ginsengs and rhodiola actually have that added benefit. To take that to the next level, another very, um, very popular Ayurvedic herb is holy basil. Holy basil is, is a unique formulation that AOR has that is holy basil by itself that will provide holy basil as an adaption, but also the additional benefits of holy basil is that it can help balance blood sugar. It can help lower elevated blood sugar. It also has an anti-anxiety and it has an anti-stress effect. Um, so it really is a nice option for those people that have the, the picture of anxiety and has dysregulated blood sugar and are looking for a formula that does not have the classic uh, adaptogens for them. So it's a really nice uh, formula to have in the back pocket for when blood sugar, anxiety, and stress are all tied in there. Additionally, it also has excellent antimicrobial effects. So it's the reason they, the, the, Arabic, um, the Arabic experts have called it holy basil is because it has so, um, it's a revered herb for its broad spectrum effects. We need to talk about sleep when it comes to stress because <clears throat> when a person is stressed, the often insomnia is one of the classic things that comes along with it. And the, and the reason is, is that stress hormones, cortisol, can actually disrupt sleep and disrupt a normal sleep cycle. And that's what um, this point here is saying, how a, a hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, hyperactivity, which is what causes in stress or what occurs in stress, can lead to fragmentation or disrupted sleep. And actually not just disrupted sleep, but actually poor quality sleep. And so getting a person sleeping again when they're in stress is probably one of the, the key things to do. Um, along with diet, nutrition, lifestyle, to actually break that cycle and help them re start recovering. Because if a person's not sleeping well, they're probably not going to be able to balance their, their blood sugar and, and cortisol um, effectively. Ideally, you want to look at getting 
between seven to nine hours of sleep a day. And you want to try to get that sleep as early uh, in the day as possible. So a lot of times people will get sleep from, let's say, 1 o'clock till 9 um, or 1, 1 a.m. till 9 in the morning, but they're missing out on those early hours of sleep, which actually have been shown to be the most um, healing and the most um, where the most recovery occurs. A lot of times when people have some sort of stress-related adrenal fatigue, um, especially chronic fatigue, they go through certain days that they feel they have good energy and then bad energy. And um, the key thing is with stress is that you want to build up slowly. You don't want to overdo it on those good days because it's easy to feel guilty that you feel tired on a few bad days where you just feel exhausted and, over, and you don't want to overdo it on those days because then you will crash again. So it's, it's a slow process and sleep is a... The key, sleep and rest are key aspects of that. Um, I want to talk about GABA for a second because we talked about how the brain is actually turned on uh, in, the, in, in a stressful situation, and the perception actually starts in the brain. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it actually has an anti-stress effect in its own right. Supplementing with GABA actually will promote relaxed alpha brain waves, decrease heart rate, it will decrease cortisol and markers of stress in the blood, uh, which is very, very important. So like adaptogens, this can also be a key uh, tool, maybe combining with something like ashwagandha uh, to have a more calming effect if nervousness, anxiety, and kind of turning on, turning on the brain or excess stimulation is, is, a, is a key complaint. Similarly, L-theanine, which is commonly found in tea, it's found in black and green tea naturally occurring, um, it actually increases the secretion of relaxing or inhibitory neurotransmitters. So those are dopamine, serotonin, and glycine. And these are very important to, again, turn down the, the stimulation on those, on those brain neurons, which actually have been put into hyperdrive because of our stressful situations. Um, and what I really like about L-theanine is that it has a very quick acute effect. So it actually can be used as an acute stress relief because it comes on within 30 to 40 minutes. A lot of times people will keep this in their, in their purse or in their car, and if they know they're going into a stressful exam or a presentation or an encounter or whatever it is, they can take this and they have that calm, not drowsy, but calm and focused effect, and that's what... Um, that's one of the major advantages of L-theanine is that it works very quickly. Alongside with GABA, it also works very quickly. A lot of times people will take that um, as, as an acute uh, remedy. So on the theme of sleep and, and, and down-regulating on the nervous system, oral sleep is one of, um, one of my favorite formulas because it really does the trick where a lot of other um, single ingredients have failed for people. It's a very comprehensive formula that works on multiple neurotransmitter pathways. So we have GABA, we have L-theanine, we have 5-HTP, which is a serotonin pathway, melatonin, that's another pathway, and then we have three botanicals that are been well studied and well known for their effects on actually decreasing um, brain function when it comes to sleep and actually calming it down. Um, so people can get a good sleep. It works very, very quickly. It usually will work in then the first few days. Um, there are some cautions if you're taking other sleeping medications or anti-anxiety medications or antidepressant medications, so be careful with that. But again, it doesn't solve the root cause, but it will, um, it will help the person, it will help you fall asleep initially as you start breaking that cycle and start working on repleting and, and rejuvenating your adrenal and, and, and your stress hormonal pathways. So it's, a, it's an excellent option if you're looking for something that um, you really want to work effectively. So let's just differentiate between a few of these phases and how can we start coupling some of these things that we talked about together. Um, if the key symptoms in the acute and resistance phases, um, for most people, they can be something, and this is, again, it, one of the unfortunate things about stress and adrenal fatigue and, and the, the whole stress hormonal picture is that symptoms are, are very greatly between people. But the classic symptoms of the acute and resistance phases are insomnia, anxiety, difficulty, losing weight, 
elevated heart rate and high blood pressure. In acute and resistant phases, the cortisol is elevated, and the, and the classic symptoms are insomnia, anxiety, difficulty losing weight, elevated heart rate, and high blood pressure. So a, a great combination actually is zen theming the holy basil in the morning and actually having either GABA or reju, rejuvenox, which is the ashwagandha, in the evening. And this actually gives you an approach that really will help you reduce the cortisol, and it's specifically focused on turning down the activated neurological system and the activated adrenal system and really bring that cortisol back down to a level where it's not causing some of the symptoms that we talked about above here. So this is a nice picture. This is a nice combination in the morning, one or the other or all of the above to actually have um, to combat the acute and resistance phases. The exhaustive phase... Um, that's, here's where you can actually add in um, orthoadapt and rhodiola, which are excellent at really helping the body bring up uh, lower levels of cortisol. Now, I do want to point out that the exhaustive phase, again, the key symptoms, there's a lot of overlap, and a lot of people are, have, probably have a combination of each one. And the best way to look at it is that there's cortisol dysregulation. So it's not the way the cortisol should be going up and down during the day. Oftentimes, when we'll measure cortisol, we'll actually, um, in, in clinically, we'll actually see cortisol is very low in the mornings when it should actually be high. And so there's different phases that each one of these things will be applicable for. The exhaustive phase, classically, you'll see a lot of fatigue, very, very profound fatigue. Again, insomnia, you may have muscle pain, low blood sugar, salt cravings, lots of sweet cravings because of that, again, that low blood sugar. Lightheadedness, especially on rising, PMS and low blood pressure. So orthoadapt and rhodiola are excellent. Orthoadapt is great for both the resistance and the exhaustive phase. So it's a great formula that will help bring cortisol down if it's high and up if it's low. But especially if it's low, it's excellent in bringing that back into balance. And then ultimately adding an advanced B complex on top of, let's say, a rhodiola or an orthodox really will help the body's ability to deal with stress and improve energy. And lastly, a lot of these things, like the advanced B-complex and the rhodiola, the withania, um, the holy basil, can be used preventatively. And that's something I encourage for us to start looking that way. A lot of the principles I talked about in this webinar when it comes to diet and lifestyle and really understanding stress and how it impacts the body, the strength of it really is in prevention. Of, uh, of things that that may occur. It's a lot easier to deal with things in, from a prevention perspective than actually going at it from a, from a treatment perspective. So let's bring everything all together. So first of all, from a stress perspective, you need to realize what are your key stressors. So I encourage you to write down your top three stressors, and then underneath each one of those, write down ways that you can actually deal with those stresses. Um, when it comes to stress, I always talk about three things you can do. You can, talk, you can either reduce the stress, you can either reframe it, or you can remove the stress. And different stresses obviously have different, different things that can be done to them. If you're in a job that you need, you can't remove it, but you may be able to reduce some, some of the impact. Um, if it's a relationship, you may be able to reframe it. So I encourage you to, to do that as a very important starting place. Secondly, look at some dietary things that we discussed. So low sugar, low refined carbohydrates, and increase the good quality nutrients, the good quality proteins and fiber. Number three, exercise and sleep. Very, very important. Equally as important as diet. 20 minutes a day is what the research studies are showing to be protective for many different health conditions, including actually reducing uh, levels of cortisol. Um, any sort of mind-body exercises, meditation, yoga, prayer, these things also have been proven to be beneficial at reducing cortisol, improving sleep. And then finally, four and five, adding in things that will actually support your stress metabolism. So magnesium, B vitamins, vitamin D are all very important for multiple uh, health benefits, especially those B vitamins when it comes to stress metabolism and adrenal health. And number five, that's when you can look at things like adaptogens. So we talked about 
licorice. We talked about rhodiola. We talked about uh, elisococcus and ashwagandha. These are all great herbs to help balance hormones, reduce cortisol, or if it's low, help bring it back up. Um, and support brain neurotransmitters through GABA and l and the B vitamins again. Um, so hopefully out of this uh, this webinar, you really learned about the big picture when it comes to, to stress on how it impacts the body and how some of the connections with certain symptoms we may be experiencing, certain disease processes we may be experiencing, how stress has a very key um, impact on those things. And hopefully there's a, a few strategies that you can um, that you can implement that will actually help you deal with that stress and help you uh, help you mitigate and help you adapt to it. So thank you. I, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to have any questions, please input them. Dr. Mainland, Dr. Templeton is standing by, and this presentation will be available for you to watch on YouTube. Again, thank you very much, and have a great day.